man, we're a week away. We're a week away from the boucherie in Baton Rouge, and I'm getting all packed up and ready to go here. We're going to talk about it today and what can expect. Stay tuned. Now, what's coming up this week is more than just the boucherie. Boucherie is celebration of, you know, basically butchering. And this is something that goes back hundreds of years for the Cajun community in and around southeast Louisiana. What is special about this particular event, at least for me, is that I get the chance to go home and actually reconnect with my cousin, who I haven't seen in 20 plus years so this is going to be a great time and this will be the last time we see each other on camera before we actually see each other in person next week so let's go ahead and bring david in and let's start talking about what to expect at the boucherie all right so i got cousin david here and we are just like i said a week away from this boucherie and um the the closer we get to it i get more and more excited you know yeah. the, all the all the little tidbits of imagery that you've been putting up over the week has mm-hmm. uh gotten me you know really excited but at the same time you know i gotta be honest with you i've never seen this live before yeah right and and i know that this is something that a lot of people maybe they get they're a little bit squeamish about uh, i mean i i, I would you know, admit to that to some extent. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you you see a lot of things that normally when uh, when you get the final product at the grocery store, it is well past the stage of what yeah. we're going to see on on Saturday. But mm-hmm. so yeah. So speaking of which, Saturday we've got there it is. Yep. So you know, all right. So you you <clears> guys <throat> are gonna now. Jordan will probably skewer me, but. He doesn't know me well enough to do that, but how do you pronounce that? Uh, well, he probably scared me too. I think it's like Fête de Boucher, uh, you know, because we say boucherie, right? And um, but Fête is like a festival of the butchers. Okay, is what it basically uh, you know, or a party of the butchers type right. of thing. So you, there's a lot of fets that you will see throughout South Louisiana uh, celebrating that. So. Um, so Boucher's, I guess, or Boucher, or, well, not Shea, but it just depends on how, I guess, which part of South Louisiana you're from. Yeah, the only time I think Boucher is, I think, Bobby Boucher from... Uh... Yeah, Bobby Boucher. <laughs> a good H2O. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, so I, I, I see, uh, you know, on this little uh, pamphlet here that you sent over, mm-hmm. it starts at 8... Right, and goes till 3. Now, 8 a.m. is when the gates open, right? Right. Okay, Mm -hmm. to the general public. Now, now, like if I I show up at 8 versus showing up at 10, am I missing something? Am I, you know, is it? It it, it, kind of depends on the stages that you want to see of the different um, products and the different tables that we're having. Okay. Uh, So... You know, even long before everybody gets there, you know, the he has all of us butchers arrive no later later than six a.m. because he does a breakfast for us. Right. Uh, because you know, the the fact is we'll be working at the tables and and really won't be stopping to eat anything. They will have some in the past. They've had like some things for the the guests. They might come up. They might be able to buy some stuff. Or in some cases, some of these tables may have little side samples for folks to take. This is some behind the scene, uh, this is behind the curtain folks. Uh, so what it does is all the butchers are in the room. And so he's, he's already assigned lead butchers to the different tables. And then he, based upon their request and what things that they would like to learn to cook um, or have cooked in the past, they will go to a certain table. So, so I'll be leading the, the uh, red and white boudin table. We do a prayer even before that's done. Uh, thanking God for the animal and for the fellowship and all. And then they'll bring the, it's like usually three to 400 pound pig. They'll bring it to a station and then they'll start preparing it. And so usually by seven o'clock, 
is when, you know, some folks might get, get in a little early and see some of that. But usually by eight o'clock when the main gates are open, you could come in and you could see that part where they're actually breaking down the animal. But they'll be doing that. They'll shave. They'll show you how they have to shave the uh, the hair off the, the pig right. before they even cut it. So those are like old methods. So you'll see that part. So if you get there at eight o'clock, most of the tables have been staged. Our teams are set up. And then the the butchers will get together and say, all right, well, and we got an ice chest with the ingredients already prepped for us. So what you'll see is these black iron pots or cauldrons that you normally see on a, a gas burner outside. And then we'll start figuring out, okay, well, we need to boil our water. We need to get our meat in there. We need to get this boiling. And so then we start seasoning. And, and then usually it's kind of a, a group as you're boiling and get your seasoning in there, we'll all kind of taste it throughout as sure. it's cooking just to see whether we think there's not enough salt and pepper in it. How does one get into this? Because, I mean, it's not like I, you can go do this anywhere, right? There's only a few times yeah. a year where this was going to happen, and it's mostly down in the south. So what, what draws what draws uh, the, the butchers to <clears throat> this particular event? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what the criteria was like the first year, because uh, as I mentioned in previous discussions we've had, uh, we have folks from Chicago, Florida. But I think in the past, it was started with either people John had known that were in the in butchery or butchers who were different restaurants or had certain styles of restaurants that were kind of more the the southern, you know, whole hog type of thing. So so initially, that's how I think the group formed. And of course, like I said, my background with him was I was, you know, participating in his, his radio show, just kind of following and suggesting and asking a lot of questions. You know, I guess that was one of the shows he had and I was always interested in. So when the opportunity came up, they sent me an invite to participate. Um, so so, but, so kind then, of a, a, a groupie turned butcher? Yeah, yeah. It's sort of like that. <laughs> okay. I'm fanboy butcher. A <laughs> fanboy butcher. Hey, hey, you know yeah. what, man? Whatever it takes to get in, you mm-hmm. know, sometimes you got to go through non traditional methods and, you know. Yeah. Well, so for instance, I see here Phil and Matt doing the on Dewey. Yeah. And the Maudlin and what's that? Ponce? Is that anything? Ponce. Yeah. yeah. I think they'll smoke it and then, then you slice it up into slices. Uh, the Maudlin is a vachery version of a uh, just an overstuffed on Dewey. It looks yeah. like a little mini football, but it's really good. And uh, that's one of the things that uh, that's usually like around Thanksgiving and Christmas. Those make sense having those all together because the 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 meat product bills from uh, Chicago, Illinois. It, is that and, the uh, tall he, dude? Is that's that the you? what the tall dude yeah. with the overalls and the yeah the yeah, beard. yeah yeah yeah. So he's got a line of products that uh, you may want to pick up his uh, pork mafia seasoning blends. So he's got like a Texas uh, gold, which I believe is, he's got like a Carolina based one. I think he's got a Memphis mud, which is really good too. And he's got a Louisiana and he's got, but you can't really find them in, in probably sporting okay. goods stores and stuff around the South, but you can order them online, usually like in a big pound bag, but he will have smaller shaken size that you can use uh to, to get those actually i can tell you one thing that they do with the pork butt is there's a dish called porchetta and it's not a traditional uh south louisiana dish it's more of an italian thing okay but um what the porchetta is is this is like one of the best things there so <laughs> it's the it's the pork belly yeah and it's laid out and it's scored on the inside and then they line it with uh, like red onions and aromatic herbs, uh, Italian herbs. Wow. And then they, in the middle of it, they put a boneless pork butt. And then they'll wrap it up. And then you you put it in the smoker and, and, and cook it or, or basically an oven type thing. So then when you get it out uh, after the fact, it's got this really hard fat crust, uh, you know, crackling, basically, or graton on the outside and then they'll break that. And I mean, then the whole inside is just melts in your mouth. And I mean, when I had that the first time I was, I I could really have gone back and eaten probably three times the amount I ate of that, but (laughs) you know, with trying to taste a little bit of everything. Right. Right. Yeah. Travis Johnson. He's done that many times in the past and he's really good at that. 
Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, I, I'll i be all over that. I'm really curious, actually, to talk a bit with with Phil about, <laughs> the, you know, his smoking methods and, you know, how he does stuff. Because I, if I remember correctly from the video, he was... <laughs> He had what basically looked like a little outhouse yeah. of smoked meats going on in there. They call uh, Old Smoky, and the story is is that that came from the uh, Cabanosi plantation. Is the plantation John grew up on? Smoky was the family outhouse, an old two seater outhouse <laughs> that they had. <laughs> I was about to say, oh yeah, because it's big, yeah, but it just it does look. I mean, look, if there was a there isn't a crescent moon on the door, is there? Uh, there may be actually. Oh, really? Okay, that would yeah. be perfect. And it's even funny because today, if you go out to Vashery, uh, some of the guys who've built their own little smokers, yeah, um, they will look like a, a an outhouse um, just because it's just that same. I guess maybe for the same reasons, because if you think about heat rising, maybe you just want things to rise up uh, instead of uh, sitting down there. <laughs> and so he, he will have that. And another group you'll want to talk to the last one, station number nine, Game Changer. Okay. Uh, Game Changer is this guy, Aaron Norris. I think it's Norris Thermal Industries or something. And uh, Trip Ryan. These two guys, uh, uh, Aaron, I think, developed this basically a way of smoking in, in a restaurant, but without having to have the big accessories, you know, all the space and all that. Yeah. It's all very computerized. Uh, yep. It's it's. It's probably one of the earlier methods I've seen of using the wood pellets. I really do actually appreciate the technology involved with doing something like that because it is pretty cool to think about that you can get a good product that tastes authentic. Yeah, I mean, there were, there were times where you know, a restaurant was 30 miles away, right? And I had yeah. that little computer doodad set up, and then I, I call it doodad like I've not been in the computer industry for 30 years. But, <laughs> you know, say the, I I set the monitor up and then I got all my temperatures and my limits and my alarm set and I'd drive home. I leave the hood fan on and I drive home and everybody's like, well, what happens if it catches fire? So I'm like, well, it's in a ceramic pit sitting underneath a hood that has a fire suppression system. So anyway. And, and you get a great point that even if with all the bells and whistles on it, you know, in the, in the sense of a, in a restaurant with the quantities that people are uh, expecting to have available yeah. at all the time. And, and so it, it is really a cool product, uh, to see, cause it stands about, it's kind of like a modern outhouse. It's, it's steel, <laughs> but it's got the, but if it's got multiple trays right. in there. And in fact, they'll do, um, I think it was maybe four or six years ago, they did a small alligator that they smoked in it. Going down this list here mm -hmm. of people, uh, you've mentioned Vance, Voker, Vokerson? Yeah, Vokerson. Yeah. I remember you saying Vance was a bit of a character, and from the video, I knew almost exactly who you were talking about because of that. Yeah. You you were describing people to a T, and I, you know, I don't pay attention to the lower thirds, you know, where they have like, yeah. you know, your name. I don't, it's like, it's, it's something a lot like, uh, you know, when you get introduced to somebody and you shake their hand and you've forgotten their name yeah. as you're shaking their hand. Yeah, that's the kind of thing that the lower thirds yeah. do for me. And he's working on Italian sausage and smoked sausage, which means yeah. I, I want to get to know Vance because yeah, um, yeah. I, that sounds like a station to be at. He's of Creole descent right? Uh, and German descent, and his family's... Uh, Vokerson Sausage, I think it's what it's called, Sausage Company. And uh, he makes the Creole hot sausage links is what I think that they're kind of very renowned for. And I think most of his sausages or his family's sausages and meats would go to, uh, were like kind of exclusively used by Leah Chase at her restaurant. And so, uh, and his wife has put out quite a, uh, a line of specialty um, mustards that they've kind huh. of, they've done and they've got some of their kids working in the uh, business as well. If you go to their Facebook page, um, they really do a good job of uh, creating little uh, vignettes and, and dance scenes and such. Um, and uh, like you talked about him sitting at the, uh, talking at the, one of the t uh, tables during the boucherie kind yeah. of singing. Uh, he's got a really great voice and uh, they've done things like around their pool in their backyard, kind of, 
uh, it looks spontaneous to me. I mean, but I'm sure it's very well. Uh, it's probably planned. Out, yeah, era. yeah. I, I really want to talk to him more, and um, and obviously, yeah. the uh, the two products he's making, I'm all about. So then we go to your station, and yep. you you are there with Todd. Um, yeah. who you mentioned. And so you're doing white and red boudin. White boudin is the meat only, and then the red boudin is with the, the hog's blood. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, um, you know, the the difference between the boudins and the other sausages is that um, if you go throughout South Louisiana, boudins are kind of cooked up. Uh, they're very similar, but they're very different. The, the people like Best Stop and Don's, those out and around Scott, I think that their their version is the kind that I really enjoy because it's a mixture of pork meat, little organ meat, in this case liver, and then rice, right. uh, medium grain rice, I think is what, uh, I know that's what I use. But it's, it's like a 60, 70% meat to rice ratio. Right. So what you'll, what you'll see is that if you uh, do a smoked sausage, you use the same casing, but your meat will be raw. With boudin, you will boil the meat and the liver first, and then you'll take that and let it cool, and then you will grind that up with mm-hmm. some of the uh, other vegetables. Then you take that rice, and then you mix them together, and then you finish it off with uh, some of the broth that the the uh, pork was cooked in. Traditionally, it was either poached or it was either steamed. Mm-hmm. Um and then over the years, it's become really popular with putting it on a grill. And then the first time I ever had it smoked over pecan wood was at, uh, from Best Stop. Really became my favorite way to, yeah. to have it. If you put it on that smoker for an hour or two with that pecan wood, yep. it transforms the flavor even more. Yeah, A lot of people will complain, yeah, I bought that boudin. I, was, Man, I just couldn't chew that skin on it. It's like, well... You cool your aunt. It's not <laughs> <laughs> well, so that yeah, and what I've been doing up here is that, like when I get best stops boudin, yeah. I will put it in the air fryer and the air yeah. fryer will crisp it up nice and good and, and cook it or heat it. It's already cooked, but it mm-hmm. heat it all the way through. So yeah, it very, very pleasant. Matter of fact, I'm I'm with you a hundred percent. Well after you get back from the boucherie you'll have a uh, like i said that booklet i was showing last week right and um you just get all your boys together and you just say look guys this weekend we're gonna make <laughs> they're gonna, gonna, gonna look at me like scratch. yeah they're gonna be like dad you are out of your <laughs> mind i would really like to go see best stops new facility and i'm, I'm hoping i can somehow finagle yeah. my way in there because i would love to see how they do things yeah. You know, you, you hit on a, a, a twice, you've mentioned it uh, or alluded to it, the fact of the appreciation of what goes into making these things. Yeah. One of the things that, if you want to call it excites, but does excite me about this, is that for people who are uninitiated or people who take for granted the food supply chain, yeah, that this is a way to really kind of see it as that that animal transitions to being food on your plate, you get to see that process. And I think it helps you develop a a better appreciation for, for what goes into it. But it, as, as you know, your ordinary average citizen, you know, you go to your butcher shop and, you know, you pick out a cut of meat or you pick out some sausage or maybe they've already done the links for you. All you have to do is toss yeah. them on the grill. But you've you've not done hardly any work. You're just essentially cooking right. and maybe heating. Uh, but that's yeah. it. Right. And that's yeah. the thing that's really cool about this boucherie is that you really do get an opportunity to see something that uh, not many people do see i was wondering the same thing the first time that i did it and um and i actually you know it was not as bad as i thought it was going to be i'm excited about understanding the process for some of these dishes Mm -hmm. we've got you know raccoon and rooster stew okay i i will go on record right now i have never had that i've yeah, I, I I don't I don't even know what to think about that. Um, but raccoon and rooster stew. 
Yeah. The raccoon and rooster stew, that was the that was the opportunity Chef John gave me to lead my own table because his theory was that because I'm coming from Alabama, I should be in charge of the raccoon <laughs> and rooster stew table. <laughs> you got to tell me, because anybody else that's watching this, what the hell does raccoon and rooster stew taste like? You will not believe it, but it is really good. I mean, I it, it was almost like a very, um, like a wild game, a mix between a wild game and a uh, chicken uh, okay. gumbo. All right. In a sense. All right. Um, the recipe, in fact, that that was one of my favorite ones to make. Thing We didn't just dump everything in there. We kind of judiciously said, well, that looks about right. And then we started adding our stocks. And and it was a really cool way that we were all tasting. Is like, and this needs some hot sauce. We didn't have any hot sauce, but somebody on the other table had some, or they could get you some from the kitchen. And so we ended up with a big pot. And that's uh, one of the early episodes of Bayou Wild is, when Don Dubuque comes up and tastes it at the, uh, at the pot there and um, you'll see it. And it, it was full and I really enjoyed it. I thought it was really good and I would have eaten it plenty of times. Um, so don't let the name, uh, well, it scare you off. You know what? Honestly, with everything else that's on this list, that's one of the least, I mean, that one I'm like, okay, I know what that is. Right. Yeah. Uh, rooster to me is, you know, just chicken. It's chicken. Uh, and yeah. raccoon is usually what you end up shooting because they're going through your your trash and my, or yeah. uh, we had an experience up here in Washington. We 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 went camping one night. I don't camp, uh, but I was coerced strongly to go <laughs> to this uh, camping event. And as soon as the fire went out, you could hear the rustling. And then all you had to do is just take a flashlight and you just aimed mm -hmm. it up in the trees. And all you saw were, I mean, dozens of pairs of eyes all looking yeah. at you going, go to bed. We'll take care of the rest, you know, because yeah. <laughs> they, they wait for the campers to go to bed and then they just tear through the, the campsite. <laughs> uh, Chris Sherrill, who will be cooking that, is um, I met him several years ago and he's very well respected around Mobile. Mm. And Gulf Shores. Uh, he's from like Eufaula, Alabama. I've met Chris before and I'm looking forward to seeing him again. And uh, he does, he'll do a phenomenal job with that recipe. Mm. But the cracklings, you know, you'll be cooking those from the pork bellies. Right. Usually put them in water, let them boil. Once all the water boils off, you've rendered all the lard. Right. And then you take those out and then you'll reheat the, um, the grease even hotter. Right. And then you put it back in. And when you put it in, the skin will pop. Yep. yep. And, um, and so there'll be some of that. So that'll that'll be really. I look forward to that all the time too. Yeah. That, um. So we got pork and sausage fricassee. The sausage fricassee. That's just a, basically another. Uh. Just some of those other pork pieces. Right. Right. Uh. Maybe pork loin type of things and sausage. That's another good stew. And then we've got the sauce patate. Yeah. Okay. Taste stew. Oh. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm making it. So they're kind of. This is kind of one of those fringe tables that. Um. You know, if you would have potatoes available yeah. during the butchery and you had some sausages, you would be making things to support the butchers as they're cooking. Um, you know, like I said, you get hungry after that time. Uh, but that's a that's a very that's a very good table to um, uh, group to watch. Uh, their their products very good. So, like I said, that's just the that's just the meat parts. Additionally, they will have like seminars of. There's a guy. Uh, that does uh, salumi type of Italian meat nice. preservation. Uh, there's a couple of historians that give talks about like either raising the wild hogs in uh, you know when they came to Louisiana originally, right? And then there'll also be um, the other part is that John is featuring a lot of his bourbons and rums that he's yeah. producing on site. Yep. Um, for those who are interested in indulging in those, I think there'll be samples of that as well as a chance to see his setup that he's got in this little building about the size of my garage. You don't need much. You really don't. No, no. <clears throat> if anything, yeah. it's uh, it's the storage space for the barrels. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what he's, that's what you would, you would see. So I know he's been working on it for at least five years or longer. Yeah. So this well, is, you know, something that he's really been looking forward to. And the other thing that's neat is, and is the architecture of the, in the layout, the three the three outdoor ovens 
yeah. that you'll see that the pig usually splayed across is is really neat. Our cousin Danny, when he went two years ago, that's one of the things that he was really kind of impressed with was was seeing how that thing was built and all. There's a pond out back. There's a, a whole line in the back of uh, uh, statues, um, holy statues. Yep. Uh, because he's got the nuns. Of course, the highlight of the of the uh, garden property, which is not, which I'm hoping to help him reignite, is the Melitone uh, <laughs> Grove in the back. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Well, I am. Uh, I need to get back to packing. Um, I this is the first time I've actually taken the studio more than 20 miles from the house, and not to this extent. So I'm trying to take my wish list and then cull it down to the essentials and hope that it all works. You know, that's, that's the hope yeah. at least, but in any case, yeah. I'm going to see you in less than a week, which is yeah. pretty rad considering it's been decades since I last saw yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to it. And, uh, um, oh, yeah, me too. And then, you know, for everybody else who's, uh, curious as to what goes on in the bushery we just will do our best to keep you in the loop and show you what's going on but if you can make it like david said tickets yeah. are still available and i would make it a point to it's something to do something fun to do on a weekend you're going to get fed and like david has said multiple times if you leave hungry it's your own fault so yeah. there's definitely no shortage of food to go around and with the educational aspect of it uh, I, I, I think there's going to be, it's, it's going to be a good solid day in it. And the best part about it is that for people who are attending, it's not the whole day. It's going to be cool in the morning, but it's supposed to be, uh, sunny. Uh, I mean, it's perfect boucherie weather. It's one of my favorite events. I mean, cause you know, with both sides of our families having, you know, as our grandparents have passed, you know, we don't always get together as often as we did when we were kids. Sure. There's some of that, that it's kind of, uh, you know, I, I look forward to it because I want I already know that the food's going to be good. And I've always met very interesting people uh, yeah. that have, you know, from different walks of life. Cause you would think that certain chefs that you meet, um, have had backgrounds in, uh, like hogshead cheese or some of the things that are either more common or, uh, not even all that exotic, but are familiar. And what you'll learn is that some of these uh, chefs, they are actually there to learn. So even the people who are training some of the people, their their experience with it is maybe not going to be the same as what you'll see from the uh, other boucheries. And and I will say too that you know this will be kind of more of geared toward a you know a, a, there'll be some suburban type of folk. You know what? It, yeah. it this is this is as much of an educational and social event than anything else. It, it, yes. It is a boucherie, and yes, you can do these other ways throughout the state. Yeah. Absolutely. But what what Chef Fulce has done is he's taking all these different people from around the U.S., really, yeah, and yeah. brought them together, different walks of life, different backgrounds. It's not, oh, yeah. not a family that's doing all this. This is the family is an extended family that is that is the people yeah. that live in the area. That's the best part about this is that there's an element to this, like what you were just saying, that there's an element to this where these people who may have been classically trained and are, for lack of a better term, experts at what they do, that yeah. are still learning. So in addition to us <clears throat> lay folks, us suburban types, learning, mm -hmm. they're learning too. And, and yeah. with all the different varied backgrounds, everybody's got experience in different things and that's it's just a ton of and it's a wealth of knowledge if you're going into it to just eat okay fine you can do that that's a really expensive ticket just to eat but if you yeah. are going there to learn the process and ask questions of the butchers ask questions yeah. of the people at the different stations Absolutely. that to me is a much better usage of your hard-earned money and at the same time, mm -hmm. your 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 knowledge of the subject. I'm getting myself excited just talking about this, but um, that yeah, I mean, it's just something that you, you, people don't get a chance to experience. What 
Chef John has said is like, yes, it, this is normally a family affair or families mm -hmm. affair yeah. that get together. But I'm bringing in people from all walks of life into yeah. this event so everybody can learn, everybody can yeah. benefit from it. And regardless of whether or not you use it yourself yeah. for your own cooking down the road, it doesn't matter. It at least gives you, like we were saying at the beginning, it gives you an appreciation of where your food is yeah. coming from and how it's prepared. That is what is makes John's boucheries unique is because even though it's not just simply just a uh, the family and the local, it, it has a whole lot. It gives you that opportunity to talk and meet people and learn. And then it's also cool to have people who grew up where their grandparents cooked it share their memories with you. Other than we know we've probably got another first cousin who's going to show up there. Uh, if I meet anybody from Vashri, I'll probably end up figuring out how we're related. So you may end up meeting some distant cousins too, Jeremy. Cool, cool. Well, yeah, we get around. We get around. Yeah.